Hello, welcome to another episode of Critic Reading Writing. My name is Atto Kwesen and I am a professor of English at Stanford University. In this episode, we will be focusing on Eunice's White Sagasso Sea and the genesis of secrecy. As is well known, White Sagasso Sea was written as a prequel to Charlotte Bronte's Jane Eyre, a classic of feminist literature. In Bronte's novel, Mr. Rochester's closely guarded secret is Bertha Mason, the mad wife that he keeps hidden in an attic at Thornfield Hall. In contrast, Reese's novel gives us the character of Antoinette Causeway, a descendant of Creole slave owners in Jamaica, who after emancipation is rescued from a life of poverty through marriage to the Rochester figure in the novel and renamed Bertha by him. However, in animating the life of Antoinette slash Bertha, Reese also stages how social secrets pertaining to post emancipation Jamaica circulate, and that illustrates concerns with miscegenation, property, and also anxieties about the threat of the white creole slide into blackness. The overgrown and unkempt natural environment in the novel is also a marker of the Creole planter class's loss of control over nature, a concomitant effect of the collapse of slavery and the apprenticeship system that was set up to succeed it after emancipation. The episode will look at how these concerns get integrated into the representation of post-plantation society through a feminist and post-colonial reading that also tests the representational choices encapsulated in the novel. When Jean Reese's White Sagasso Sea was first published in 1966, it was quickly recognized as providing a crucially important prequel to Charlotte Bronte's Jane Eyre, which was itself first published just over a century earlier in 1847. Whereas Bronte's novel is a Bildungs roman predominantly focused on the life and tribulations of the eponymous heroine, Rees shifts the focus onto the biography of Antoinette Causeway, Bertha Mason, the one who would become the mad woman in the attic of Jane Eyre. Bronte's novel itself became an important touchstone of feminist criticism from the 1970s onward, starting with Sandra M. Gilbert's famous essay, A Dialogue of Self and Soul, playing Jane's progress, and has since then remained at the lively intersection of debates on disability studies, representations of nature, and of feminism among various others. To these debates, Reese's novel adds the colonial relationship between the 19th century British sub-aristocracy and the ramp of the slave plantation owner class in the then West Indies. In White Sagasso Sea, we first encounter Antoinette as a nine-year-old girl in a Creole slave plantation family that is in dire straits after emancipation. We follow Antoinette's early life through the horrible traumas she suffers when a fire raises her home at the Colibri estate that kills her disabled brother. We also are with her into young adulthood as she meets and marries the Rochester figure in the novel and subsequently suffers a nervous breakdown after she discovers 
that he has cheated on her with one of their female servants. To understand how Reese's novel stages the social anxieties pertaining to the Creole slave planter class in post-emancipation West Indian society, we have to first grasp the events depicted in the Jamaican sections of the novel within their historical context so that we can see the residual and unresolvable social contradictions that remained after the abolition of slavery. Slave importation throughout the British Empire was stopped through the enactment of the Slave Trade Act in 1807. But it is the Slave Emancipation Act of 1833 that effectively abolished the owning of slaves in all its forms and not just the trade in them. In the West Indies, abolition was followed immediately by an apprenticeship system, which lasted from 1834 to 1838, when it was discontinued due to the non-cooperation of the ex-slaves. The apprenticeship system was originally put in place to protect the slave plantations from the loss of labor that would ensue after abolition. The system required ex-field hands to work on the plantations of their masters for a period of another six years, while household slaves were to serve for an extra four years after emancipation. Apprentices were required to work up to 45 hours a week without compensation, but were to be paid for any additional labor they performed. In exchange for their unpaid labor, the apprenticeship system provided the ex-slaves with food, housing, clothing, and medical treatment, even though the act did not specify the quantities of these items. The British government had also agreed to pay compensation to plantation slave owners to the tune of 20 million pounds which is the equivalent of approximately 2 billion 400 million pounds or 3 billion and 150 million dollars in today's money. 20 million pounds in 1833 amounted to approximately 5% of Britain's GDP and so was considered a very large sum of money indeed. The irony of course was that none of this amount was earmarked for the ex-slaves themselves. The introduction of the apprenticeship system as a buffer against the loss of slave labor did not go according to plan. A large proportion of the ex-slaves chose to abandon the slave plantations and rather to settle in free villages, often forming cooperatives to buy bankrupt or abandoned sugar estates. And where they lacked the capital, they simply squatted on vacant lands and continued the cultivation of many of the food crops that the planters and the colonial government had exported during the days of slavery. White Sagasso Sea is set in the face before the financial compensation has arrived after the Emancipation Act, but after most ex-slaves have already left the employment of their slave masters and eluded the apprenticeship system. Given the historical context in which the novel is set, it is evident that the house servants of Antoinette and her mother Annette early in the novel and later those of Antoinette and her husband Rochester were part of the apprenticeship system. Even though Jean Rees does not refer to this fact directly. But it is also clear from what we see that these house servants were not being properly compensated for their services. 
This then explains in part the palpable disdain and anger we find from the servants toward their white masters and mistresses within the novel. The exception is Christophine, a free Martinican ex-slave that was given to Antoinette by her mother and who in the novel stands as the source of anti-colonial spiritual and practical knowledge, including that of Obia, as we shall see in a moment. In illuminating the life of Antoinette, a daughter and descendant of slave owners, White Sagasso C also reimagines the fraught history of the Creole planter class and their loss of both financial and cultural capital in the West Indies. We see especially their anxieties about money, but also their fear of lapsing into what they consider to be a decrepit form of blackness like their slaves. Early in the novel, Antoinette and her mother Annette are referred to as white cockroaches by the black characters at Culibri Estate, where they live and are treated with utmost disdain. Annette is at first shown as being lethargic and depressed, but it is when her daughter comes home one day wearing the torn clothes of her black friend Tia that Annette is galvanized out of her stupor of depression to do something to save her child from the imminent threat of blackness. What has happened is that after a quarrel between the two girls while they play by the bathing pool, Tia swaps their clothes and leaves the scene unceremoniously so that Antoinette is obliged to wear Tia's shabby and torn clothes home in place of her own. When she returns home wearing Tia's dress, her mother makes a big fuss and in the days that follow, seems to find a new lease of life. As we are told by Antoinette, who narrates the first part of the novel, her mother borrows a horse. She rode off very early and did not come back till late the next day, tired out because she had been to a dance or moonlit picnic. She was gay and laughing, younger than I had ever seen her, and the house was sad when she was gone. It is not long after that that Annette meets and remarries Mr. Mason, also one of the newly arrived wealthy investors from England who seeks to buy up cheap properties in the West Indies. It is this Mr. Mason who bequeaths to Antoinette a new surname and a number of properties that the Rochester figure takes from her when he in turn marries her. The unwanted exchange of clothes between the two girls also acts as a form of metonymic displacement that signals the way in which Antoinette is figured as bearing the symbolic stamp of blackness in the novel. As we shall see shortly, this transposition of a black identity onto the white Creole character of Antoinette is important to how we see her later in relation to her Rochester husband, who comes down from England to marry her and thus acquire the properties that have been bequeathed to her by her family. White Sagasso C defines a series of hierarchies between British capitalism and the financially depleted white Creole planter class, between the local blacks and their erstwhile white masters and mistresses, and most poignantly, between Rochester and his wife, Antoinette. Uh, in which the other hierarchies are instantiated and materialized as aspects of their marriage. 
It is also important to note that Antoinette and Rochester have completely different and opposing emotional responses to the natural environment and the ex-slaves within it. And so this is what we see of nature early in the novel. Our garden was large and beautiful as that garden in the Bible. The tree of life grew there, but it had gone wild. The paths were overgrown and a smell of dead flowers mixed with the fresh living smell. Underneath the fern trees, tall as forest tree ferns, the light was green. Orchids flourished out of reach or for some reason not to be touched. One was snaky looking, another like an octopus with long, thin, brown tentacles bare of leaves hanging from a twisted root. Twice a year, the octopus orchid flowered, then not an inch of tentacle showed. It was a bell-shaped mass of white, mauve, deep purples, wonderful to see. The scent was very sweet and strong. I never went near it. The sensual lushness described here is tied directly to an idea of unkemptness and even decay. We see then that Antoinette's life begins in a sensual but corrupt paradise. Furthermore, in the early parts of the novel, the almost pantheistic connection to nature is coupled to an antipathy toward people, especially given Antoinette and her mother's social isolation and dread of what the ex-slaves might be saying about them. The wildness in the garden symbolizes a loss of energy required to produce order in nature, in politics, and in the social hierarchy. In White Sagasso Sea, nature's unkemptness is also a signifier of the loss of slavery, and thus the depletion of authority over those that might be made to make the place tame and clean in the old discredited system. While Antoinette sees herself as part of the natural West Indian environment and identifies herself with it, Rochester is always overwhelmed and suspicious of her, of nature, and of the black characters he finds there. One of the features of White Sargasso Sea that we keep being returned to again and again is the degree to which people's opinions are shaped by gossip and rumors. Now what you and I call gossip and rumors, security services everywhere call intelligence. Plus, there are courses in business schools called organizational storytelling that rely heavily on what might be considered the domain of gossip and rumors that circulate within organizations. The point is that gossip and rumors are far from useless, but are the conduits through which the moral maps of social relationships in given communities are established. Rumors and gossip are also predictive and disciplinary instruments since no one wants to be the victim of bad stories about themselves. While there are many occasions for the circulation of such stories in Reese's novel, the most important source of gossip by far is Daniel Causeway, who claims to be Antoinette's half-brother and writes a poison letter to her husband. When later Rochester goes to meet with him, 
Daniel Causeway makes some scurrilous accusations about the madness that runs in Antoinette's side of the family. There seems to be some basis for these accusations, but they are magnified and twisted by him beyond all recognition. After the fire that burns down Colibri estate and kills her son, Annette does descend into madness and has to be placed in excluded care away from her daughter. But we are not permitted to judge easily whether Antoinette's own madness is congenital or brought on by her mistreatment at the hands of her husband. At any rate, Daniel Causeway also insists that he was the son of the slave owner Alexander Causeway, father of Antoinette, and that even though he had tried many times to have his supposed father accept him, he was consistently and rudely brushed aside, thus stoking his deep-seated anger and resentment. Daniel Causeway's struggles for legitimacy have a special resonance in post-plantation West Indian society. Given that slave owners frequently took sexual advantage of their female slaves and often had children with them, the question of legitimacy was also specifically to be seen played out on the color palette of skin tones all across the region. The skin tones of different black characters is regularly referred to throughout the novel. And Daniel Causeway explicitly refers to his own yellow skin color as proof that he has white blood in him. What Richard Lynn and other scholars have referred to as the pigmentocracy of today's Caribbean starts from the period of slavery and in white sagacity is dramatized as a question of legitimacy. And yet, from the perspective of Rochester, what Daniel Causeway tells him only serves to confirm his revulsion at the thought of the miscegenation that has been produced by the crossing of white Creoles with their black slaves. He leaves the interview with Daniel Causeway completely confirmed in his disgust for what he sees as the taint of his wife's debased Creole status. And it is this that starts the process of his progressive loss of love for her and his growing cruelty, in spite of the fact that when he asks her about the accusations, she asserts quite forcefully that she has no kinship with Daniel Causeway and is supported in this by Christophine. The central contradiction inherent to the institution of marriage for the Creole woman is that it withdraws the independent means of material support from her while installing sexual desire as the absolute means of her self-validation. For the man, on the other hand, his sexual freedoms are multiplied. These contradictions were part of the married contract in 19th century Britain, but their dastardly effects get illustratively magnified when applied in the relationship between Rochester and Antoinette. And it is this that we see painfully played out when Rochester cheats on his wife with their female servant, Amélie, while Antoinette sleeps in the next room. By this time, Rochester clearly designs to inflict maximum psychological damage on his wife. But this pathetic episode itself comes after Antoinette has gone to plead with Christophine for some obia to make her husband come back to her bed. And this is what we see. Christophine, 
He does not love me. I think he hates me. He always sleeps in his dressing room now, and the servants know. If I get angry, he is scornful and silent. Sometimes he does not speak to me for hours, and I cannot endure it anymore. I cannot. What shall I do? He was not like that at first, I said. Pink and red hibiscus grew in front of her door. She lit her pipe and did not answer. Answer me, I said. She puffed out a cloud of smoke. You ask me a hard thing. I tell you a hard thing. Pack up and go. Go? Go where? To some strange place where I shall never see him. No, I will not. Then everyone, not only the servants, will laugh at me. It is not you they laugh at if you go. They laugh at him. I will not do that. Why you ask me if when I answer you say no? Why you come up here if when I tell you the truth you say no? But there must be something else I can do. She looked gloomy. When man don't love you, more you try, more he hates you. Man like that. If you love them, they treat you bad. If you don't love them, they after you night and day, bothering your soul case out. I hear about you and your husband, she said. But I cannot go. He's my husband after all. She spat over her shoulder. All women, all colors, nothing but fools. Three children I have, one living in this world, each one a different father, but no husband. I thank my God. I keep my money. I don't give it to no worthless man. When must I go? Where must I go? But look me trouble, a rich white girl like you and more foolish than the rest. A man don't treat you good, pick up your skirt and walk out. Do it and he come after you. He won't come after me and you must understand I am not rich now. I have no money of my own at all. Everything I had belongs to him. What you tell me there? She said sharply. That is English law. Law? The Mason boy fix it. That boy worse than Satan, and he burn in hell one of these fine nights. Listen to me now, and I advise you what to do. Tell your husband you're feeling sick. You want to visit your cousin in Martinique. Ask him pretty for some of your own money. The man not bad-hearted. He give it. When you get away, stay away. Ask more. He give again and well satisfied. In the end, he come to find out what you do, how you get on without him. And if he see you fat and happy, he want you back. Men like that, better not stay in that old house. Go from that house, I tell you. You think I must leave him? You ask me, so I answer. In the end, Antoinette does not take Christophine's advice and instead pressurizes her to give her an aphrodisiac powder to put in her husband's drink and lure him to her bed. She does succeed in doing this, but Rochester realizes the next day what has happened and is filled with hatred and revulsion toward her after that. The significant aspect of the conversation between Antoinette and Christophine, however, is what Christophine is telling her is that she should withdraw herself from the disempowering structure inherent to her arranged and loveless marriage. For the terms of the marriage contract in the 19th century, as we noted a moment ago, 
dictated that all of a woman's property went to her husband upon marriage. Thus, the married woman lost the capacity to sustain herself economically, leaving her sexual desirability as the only means by which she could find validation from her husband. It is this order of things that Christophine seeks to help Antoinette see and break away from. But Antoinette is so dependent on that form of validation that she cannot see herself pulling away from her unloving and increasingly cynical husband. Her practice of obia itself is a direct critique not only of Western forms of knowledge and social arrangements, but it's also fundamentally different as a way of being that is not dependent on the transactional structures of slavery, but instead turns on the intrinsic value inherent to persons. In this, we see that Christophine also disavows a fundamental tenet of the slave economy and its residual aftermath, so that in the novel, she stands distinct from both the black and the white characters as they are depicted in the post-emancipation West Indies. Even though Antoinette spurns Christophine's advice regarding her husband, we find at the same time that she has imbibed some of the critical lessons available to her through Christophine's articulation of an alternative black cultural logic. Thus both Christophine and Thea flicker in Antoinette's consciousness when she sets fire to Thornfield Hall at the end of the novel. In setting fire to Thornfield Hall, Antoinette fulfills the teleology of the intertextual relationship between white Sagasusi and Jane Eyre. But this teleology also reveals something that is entirely absent from Bronte's novel, which is that the burning down of Rochester's mansion is not merely the revenge of the mad woman in the attic but also the return of the colonially repressed West Indian culture, which is signified in the novel by Christophine, but which in Jane Eyre is firmly disfigured as a potential source of revenge. But the context of empire cannot be separated from that of how we read British 19th century literature. As Beatrice Spivak tells us in one of the most widely cited essays on white Sagato see in postcolonial studies, it should not be possible to read 19th century British literature without remembering that imperialism understood as England's social mission was a crucial part of the cultural representation of England to the English. The role of literature in the production of cultural representation should not be ignored. Thank you very much. Please refer to reading suggestions on the novel in the episode description below. And if you like this episode, remember to give a thumbs up subscribe and share, hit the notifications bell, and enter your comments in the section below. See you next week.